Hi everyone, I'm Jen and I make useful English Lit Study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more. So some of you have requested that I make a video on the character Iago in Othello. So if you're studying the play Othello, make sure to check out my other videos on the play if you haven't already, where I analyse characters like Othello, Desdemona, Amelia, as well as key themes like jealousy and marriage. You can click on the playlist here. So, if you're already familiar with Othello, you know that Iago is the evil antagonist who wrecks havoc on every relationship in the play, from undermining the professional goodwill between Othello and his lieutenant Cassio, to destroying the noble marriage between Othello and Desdemona, and finally to murdering his own wife, Amelia. There's pretty much consensus across the board that Iago is evil personified, and much of literary scholarship has been dedicated to figuring out the true motives behind the evil actions of this evil man. So throughout the play, Iago offers multiple and often conflicting reasons for why he's so bad. For example, he says Othello passed him over for a promotion and he's salty about it, or that Othello is suspected to be carrying on an affair with Amelia, his wife. But anyway, he goes back and forth between these reasons, so it's really hard to pinpoint just exactly what induces him to inflict such pain and suffering on the people around him. But the thing is though, there's probably enough analysis out there focusing on what makes Iago so despicable. And to be honest, a reading that reduces Iago to nothing but pure evil is probably not the most sophisticated reading. So in this video then, I'm going to have us be devil's advocates by looking at what we can learn from Iago instead. No pun intended. Because beyond Iago's devilishness, there's actually wisdom to be gained about human nature from his words. And so with that, let's dive straight in. Now a good moment that epitomises Iago's duality comes right after he has planted the seed of doubt in Othello's mind about Desdemona's possible infidelity, as when Othello comments, this fellow's of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. Now his comment is of course dramatically ironic, because up until this point we've been told time and again by Iago that he is not what he is, and that he's putting up a benign front to hide his malevolent plans. What's interesting though is that Iago sees duality as a necessary and rational quality for anyone who wishes to survive. So wearing one's heart on their sleeve is a foolish endeavour, he says, as he begins the play with these words. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. We cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. Now note the mirroring devices in these lines. There's the epistrophe of all masters in we cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. There's also the anaphora of cannot all be, cannot be. Now these sonic echoes embody the idea of obedience and reflect the pattern of dutiful behaviour, with one following the other. But equally, by coming in twos, they also embody the notion of duplicity. There's a natural causality implied in the syntax of these statements, as the claims follow one another in mimetic sequence. So the implication here is that serving one's master to serve oneself is just what logical people would do, and is a sensible course of action, whether or not that really is the case. So note as well the double negative in nor all masters cannot be truly followed. So Iago means to say that just because someone is our superior doesn't mean we should necessarily obey them, which is true to a certain extent because what if we encounter bad bosses? Yet the double negative of nor cannot be confuses this message and makes it sound as if he's saying that it's technically possible for us to obey all our masters, but the possibility in Iago's mind is of course nil. So from his early speech patterns then, we see Iago's two-faced subconscious coming through. Later, in Act 4, Scene 1, Iago reinforces this idea of necessary duplicity when he half consoles, half chastises Othello, who by this point is so broken down by Iago's poisonous suggestions of Desdemona's adultery that he can no longer think straight, as he says, Does thou mock me? I mock you? No, by heaven! Would you bear your fortune like a man? Oh, 
cornered man's a monster and a beast. There's many a beast then in a popular city, and many a civil monster. So in this exchange between Othello and Iago, we continue to see Iago's linguistic mimesis as a surface reflection of his obedience, as he echoes the key words in Othello's statements, like mock, monster, and beast. But while the two men use the same words, they don't use them with the same connotations. Instead, it's rather the opposite. In fact, Othello's claim that a hornet man's a monster and a beast is ironic, because while he means a hornet man to be a cuckold, he's actually looking at a hornet man in the sense of a devil, who is, of course, Iago. So his conception of monster and beast is the conventional one, i.e. evil, cruel creatures. But to Iago, monster and beast refer to no more than your average man about town, because as everyone will inevitably experience betrayal in life, he believes this will consequently render them beasts who seek revenge. What's more, the oxymoron, a civil monster, reveals his belief that most people operate by putting up a civil front while hiding behind monstrous intentions. So as Iago says, these are not monstrous civilians, but rather civil monsters, which reflects his cynical view that humans at the heart of their identity are monsters and that they are only conditioned by social circumstances to be civil to each other. As we can see, monster being the noun, which indicates the essence of us, and civil as the adjective, as only the accessory quality. So now, grim as this may sound, when we consider how human history is basically one cyclical loop of warfare and struggles, Yago's words, while rather unsavory, also kind of reveals the blunt truth about humanity. By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. Now if you've read enough of Shakespeare's plays, you'll have noticed by now that appearance versus reality is a favourite theme. In Othello though, reality isn't so much determined by appearances, i.e. what's laid out on the surface, as it is by perception, i.e. what's concocted in the mind. Iago is a master of creating perceptions, and this talent of his is what enables him to ensnare everyone in his deadly web of lies. So a key moment which shows this is when Othello, already incensed by the thought of his wife's disloyalty, demands that Iago give him some proof. To which Iago asks, would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on, behold her topped? So cruelly, Iago asks if Othello would be willing to catch his wife in the act, which indeed would be solid proof but probably not anything Othello would actually want to see. And the solution to this, Iago suggests, simply perceive her to be disloyal. And she is. Death and damnation! Oh! <gasps> it were a tedious difficulty, I think, to bring them to that prospect. Damn them, then! If ever mortal eyes do see them bolster more than their own. What then? How then? What shall I say? Where's satisfaction? It is impossible you should see this. Were they as prime as goats, as hot as monkeys, as salt as wolves in pride, and fools as gross as ignorance made drunk? But yet, I say, if imputation and strong circumstances which lead directly to the door of truth will give you satisfaction, you may have it. So in a slew of violent questions, Iago points out the ludicrous impossibility of Othello ever wanting to see Cassio and his wife in bed. The truth is unpalatable, Iago says. So why would you ever want to see the truth for yourself? As he claims, if ever mortal eyes do see them bolster more than their own, where is satisfaction? It is impossible you should see this. But Iago then goes on to paint a vivid scene of Desdemona and Cassio's imagined cuckoldry with graphic animal imagery, 
And so he does this so well that he solidifies in Othello's mind the perception of his wife as an unfaithful woman, and thereby eliminating any more need of solid proof. So Iago then concludes with a metaphor. He says, it's enough to simply reach the door of truth, and entering into truth itself is unnecessary. So the metaphor of a door is interesting because while doors can open up new insights for us, they can also close us off to information. And the word perception implies seeing things from one angle and hence being closed off to seeing the whole picture. And in Othello's case, he falls victim to Iago's tools of perception creation, these imputation and strong circumstances. And so this ultimately is what results in the Moor's tragedy. As the poison of perception takes greater hold over Othello's mind, he loses his understanding of what seeing actually means, which Iago takes advantage of skillfully, as he goes on to say, Nay, be but wise, yet we see nothing done. She may be honest yet. Tell me but this. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? I gave her such a one was my first gift. I know not that, but such a handkerchief, I'm sure it was your wife's. Did I today see Cassio wipe his beard with? If, if it be that, if it be that, or any that was hers, it speaks against her with the other proofs. Oh, that the slave had 40,000 lives! One is too poor, too weak for my revenge. Now do I see tis true. So while Iago says, yet we see nothing done, we don't know if, you know, anything has actually happened yet, he also asks if Othello has not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand. So in a cunning move, Iago links up two different scenes, one hypothetical and the other one real, and maps them onto Othello's frenzied mind as one truth. So while Desdemona cheating has not actually been seen, because of course it's not true, Desdemona using the strawberry spotted handkerchief has been seen. But because both are referred to by the same verb of sight, Othello is subconsciously driven to equate the two references, and therefore he projects erroneously from his memory of seeing his wife with the handkerchief onto the imagined sight of Desdemona's adulterous act. Now do I see it as true, he says, but of course he hasn't actually seen anything. So by leveraging all kinds of verbal trickery, Iago is able to weave not just a web of lies, but also concoct this network of perceptions by linking one association with another. So while someone with an equally rational nature may have been able to see through Iago's antics, Othello is an emotionally driven character. And so this is why he is too consumed by his passions to ever untangle to illogicalities in Iago's argument. So the final idea in this video is one that we cannot deny. People are fickle. And Yago's deep, unromantic awareness of this is what cinches the success of his plan. Ironically, this isn't because Desdemona is fickle, but rather that Othello is. In the early stages when Yago is still trying to convince Rodrigo of the success of their plan, he asserts, it cannot be that Desdemona should long continue her love to the Moor, put money in thy purse, nor he his to her. It was a violent commencement, and thou shalt see an answerable sequestration Put but money in thy purse. These moors are changeable in their wills. Fill thy purse with money. The food that to him now is as luscious as locusts shall be to him shortly as bitter as Coloquintida. She must change for youth. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. She must have change. She must, therefore, put money in thy purse. Now, the repeated word change is a pun, because while change as a verb means to pivot, 
As a noun, it refers to coins and hence the phrase loose change. And of course this is apt because Iago is trying to convince Rodrigo into giving him more money at this point. But in Iago's mind, these two meanings of change aren't that distant from each other. Because to him, human relationships are merely systems of trade and exchange anyway. So like money in the market, relationships change hands on a regular basis. And just as no one would ever hold on to the same pile of banknotes for too long, we shouldn't be surprised if people frequently switch partners as practical needs deem necessary. This is Yago's view, by the way. I don't believe in that. The other analogy Yago uses to compare Othello and Desdemona's relationship is food. As he says, that the food to the moor is now as luscious as locusts, shall be to him shortly as bitter as Coloquintina, and that when she, Desdemona, is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. So in Iago's cynical orbit, there's no place for romance the sublime, because human relationships are solely practical functions that help one achieve specific ends, and they are discarded once they've exhausted their use. He degrades Othello and Desdemona's marriage with this base analogy of bodily consumption, because we know that with ingestion comes excretion, and the entire process isn't one that takes long, which again underscores his point about the changeability of men and women in love. Unfortunately, Othello to some extent proves Iago right, as we eventually see from the speed with which he loses faith in Desdemona, which takes only one scene's worth of time in Act 3, Scene 1 for his full conversion to happen. And that's it for this video, guys. I hope this close reading of Iago gives you a better understanding of this character and to see him not as a flat representation of evil, but rather as a complex repository of deep but dark truths about human nature. In many ways, Iago is a mirror of the monster and beast that lurk within us all, reflecting the extent to which we are capable of hurting each other underneath our capes of civility. So anyway, if you found this video helpful, please be sure to hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel, and switch on that bell notification so that you never miss a useful English Lit Study video from me. And I'll see you guys very soon.